Oh, hello there. I'm Michael Fudge here working out in my hot garage on a summer day. I'm hoping that this lesson gives you a lift and I'm sure you can't wait to get it started. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome. It's time for the last unit um, using the SQL select statement and we're going to get into some advanced query patterns. Let's dive right in. So the agenda, we'll look at the set operators first. These are um, operators that allow us to combine two select queries together to produce a unified uh, single output. Then we'll also look at the pivot operator which allows us to create, take rows of data and transform them into columns of data, creating cross tabulations. And then we'll look at unpivot, which allows us to take several columns and combine them into a, a single column of row with, where the data is in the row. So just two ways to, dif to transform your data. And then we'll uh, follow up and finish with temporal tables and temporal queries. All right, so let's get started here with the set operators. So set operators combine two select queries together. When you do this, there's only going to be one order by clause and it's gonna be applied to the combined output. So you cannot sort the first select query and sort the second select query and then join them together with a set operator. The order by has to come in the second select or the final select. Uh, the column names and the output, as we'll see, are taken from the first select. So if you have an alias for a column in the first select statement, that's going to be the name of the column in the output. The intermediary select statements that are combined together, they, they, those names are not adopted. And the requirement for set operators is that the number of columns must be the same in each of the select statements, and each column needs to be the same data type. So here's a basic syntax of how the set operators work. You have a select statement here, and then another one here, and then between the two select statements, you're putting a set operator. And then finally, you can conclude by an order by if you want to. So before we get into a demo, let's learn one set operator. Let's start with the simplest set operator, union all. Union all is a concatenation of both outputs. So as an example here, let's suppose I have table A and I have table B and table A just has two rows, one and two, and table B has rows one and three. A union all operation of these two tables would yield four rows um, where one and two are in the output and one and three are in the output. So it simply combines all of the output together. So it's a way to take the output from two queries and then merge them together into a single unified output. All right, let's play around with um, this, but we're going to sort of look at it from the angle of just understanding how these set operators behave and what their rules and constraints are. We're not gonna get too much into actually writing any set oriented queries. We're just going to use that union all operator that we know to sort of play around um, and understand like the behavior of the set operations. Okay, let's get into it. All right, I'm out here in Azure Data Studio and let me just put something together here. So I'm going to take this select bacon, which if you run this, it just shows you bacon. And I'm going to union that with cheese. And what I'll get back is a combined result set of bacon and cheese, one per each row. I can also add another union all in here if I wanted to. And this would combine another query together. Let's do eggs. I'm hungry this morning. And so now you have three rows in the result set. Now these can be 
these can be tables. You don't have to do the select this way, but again, I'm just trying to keep it simple for demonstration purposes so that you understand how these set operators behave. So the first thing you wanna know about the set operators is you can only have one order by, and that occurs at the end of the um, set operators. Now I can't order by this because I don't have a name for these columns. I didn't alias these columns, right? So let me give a, um, a name to these. I'll call this as food, and then I can order by food. So now it sorts them uh, in alphabetical order and it uses the column uh, name food. And that's because that's the first column name in, in the query up here. If I go down here and call this as something and this one at, um, as other, you'll see that it does not use something or other, it just uses food. So. That's something that you need to recognize about the, the set operators is the aliasing is only relevant and the column names are only relevant to the first query. The, the subsequent queries do not matter. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing you wanna understand is that you must have compatible columns. So let me start this over, like this is great, but let me do another one now. I'll save this one, okay. And let's try this. So let's say select um, as name, as age, okay. And then let's union all that with select as age, as name. Watch what happens when we try to combine these two queries together with a union all. We get conversion failed um, from varchar to int because this first column, right, if I run these without the union all, I'll see two outputs, right? And this first column does not line up with the second column. This first column is varkar. The second column is int. They have to be the same type. Okay, so that, that's one of the requirements. Now, just because it says name and age doesn't mean anything. I can call this one name and this one age, and it still doesn't work because, again, it's all about the data types. It's not about the column names at all. The column names are irrelevant. So that's another thing that you need to consider when you're trying to build queries that are set compatible, is that they must have the same types in each of the columns so that they can be combined. And then thirdly, there must be the same number of columns. So like, let me just add a null column here. See, I still get it says you can't do this because you need an equal number of expressions in your projection. So up here, I need to provide another column up here. And so now I have that third column and there's a value of one here and there's a value of null for the second row. Now, later on, we're gonna learn how to use these set operators on real tables. But again, now I'm just trying to get you to understand the basic rules of how the set operators work. Okay, so you need to have the same number of columns. Those columns need to be uh, compatible in types. Okay, if I may, <clears throat> for a minute, let me speak to the union all, the union all operator. The union all operator is a true concat. So if I were to copy this and just paste it and then put another union all in here, it's gonna just combine all these together and it's, you know, it's gonna duplicate the rows. There's no entity integrity here in the output. It just, you know, is going to concatenate all of the values from each of the select statements output. So that's basically how the set operators behave and more specifically how union all works. Let's move on and look at the union operator. So the union operator, 
performs a, a true set union of queries A and B, that means you will grab rows from either A or B or both, and then the output is only going to have distinct rows, and therefore the output will have entity integrity. So here's an example. We have table A, which has a um, 1, a 2, and a 1. And on purpose, this table does not have entity integrity because 1 repeats, but that's fine. I'm just here to show you the demo. And then this is table B, and table B has 1 and 3. So when we union these two tables together, we're going to get a combined output of distinct values from A and distinct values from B. Oh, this, should, this column should say B here. Okay, And then in, in essence, we will have um, 1, 2, 3, and then this one and that one are not distinct, so they therefore do not repeat. Okay, so that's the set union operator. Okay, here's how set intersection works. Set intersection um, returns a result set where only values that are found in both A and B, and again, these are distinct and therefore have entity integrity. So let's use the same example from before. We have table A, one, two, one, no entity integrity here, doesn't really matter. Table B, 1, 3 has an entity integrity. When you intersect these, it's only going to take the values that are found in both A and B. So the intersection of these only has one row, 1, because 1 is found in B and 1 is found in A. And <clears throat> that 1 is um, distinct, and therefore the entire table has entity integrity. Okay, the third set operator that we're learning in this segment is accept, and it accept performs a set difference between um, queries A and B. And basically what it says is return the values in A that are not in B. So the output only has distinct rows and again, entity integrity. The true set operators, that is accept, intersect, and union, those all return distinct values. Union all does not. Union all is really just a, a concatenation of rows. So in the accept operator, here's uh, we have the same sets as before, and we will now take the difference between the two, which is just going to yield two, because one was found in, in table B, three is in table B, but not in table A, and then two is the only value that is found in A, but not in B. You can see that this is sort of <clears throat> an a, uh, asymmetrical operator compared to union or um, intersection, right? This does not take any values at all from B. It merely uses B as a means to omit values from A. So A except B and B except A are not necessarily going to yield the same set. Okay, let's do another example here. We got a demo. Uh, we'll go back to the demo database. There's two tables in there of products. One product table comes from Fudge Mart, and the other product table comes from Micazon. And uh, we'll take a look at what products are offered by both companies. We'll take a look at products that are offered only by Fudge Mart. We'll take a look at products that are only offered by Micazon. And then we'll make a list of products that are offered by uh, one. Uh, either one of the companies but not both to show you how you can combine set operators okay uh, let's get busy with the demo all right here i am out in azure data studio again and let's take a look at the micazon products first so there's the micazon products and uh here are the fudge mart products and there are just enough products in here where it would be very difficult for a human being to, to locate the, the products that are common to both, okay? So, you know, there's an LCD, a 20-inch LCD monitor in here, right? And if I look through Micazon, I don't know, maybe there's a 20-inch LCD monitor in here. I don't know. It, there's a lot to look through. So let's use a set operator to figure that out. Now, what I don't want to do is just intersect the entire two tables, if I could spell intersect right, because there's other factors here like product retail price, um, department, product ID, which may not be the same. And then when I intersect these, um, first of all, they're not even intersection compatible because I think Fudge Mart has more columns. It has a wholesale price and Micazon does not. 
Because, like, I'm Fudge Mart and Mike Azan's my competitor, and I wouldn't have their wholesale price. I'd only have their retail price. But even if, regardless, if you were to just take um, these four columns from Mike Azan and then take the same four columns from Fudge Mart, the intersection wouldn't be very useful because it makes assumptions about product IDs and things like that, right? Um, and, and I can show you that. Let me just quickly. Product department, product name, product retail price. Okay, so now these are gonna be compatible. And when I intersect them, I get nothing. And if you look carefully, you'll see why the product IDs are not the same. So Sledgehammer has product ID 12. And does this one have a Sledgehammer? It does, and it's product ID 2. So when you're dealing with competitor's data, you're not going to know what their, what their product IDs are. Really, what I want to do is compare the product names here. So I'm just going to include product names in my query. And so these product names are found in both companies. So both companies offer these products. And uh, I guess if if you don't believe it, we could take a look. Let's look for X train shoes. That should that should show up pretty easily. Let's see. I go down to the bottom. I should see X train shoes in here somewhere. I guess I could use a where clause where product I name like X. There's the X train shoes in Micazon. And there's the X train shoes in Fudge Mart. So you can see that there are a lot of products that both companies offer. And maybe that's not as interesting as you thought. Um, generally, when I'm using these kind of queries, I like to think about the quantities of each of the sets. So <clears throat> I might do something like this. I might say, you know, select, you know, count the rows from Micazon products as, and this is going to be um, as Micazon count. 53 products in Micazon. Select count as Fudge Mart count from Fudge Mart products. 53 in Fudge Mart. Uh, it's kind of not a coincidence, trust me. And then you might want to count this, which you would do as you have to write a subquery. Select count star as combined count from this as combined right so i made this into a table this is called a table valued expression right this query i'm treating it like a table and i'm not using with so i can run this get combined so there's 40 products combined. Now what's cool about the set operators is somebody might wanna see a report of just this information. So this is where you could use union all. Right, and then produce a single output. You know, Mike is on count. Okay, now the column names are horrible, right? So uh, I'm gonna call this one count. And then watch this trick. Over here, I'm going to make a column. I'm going to generate a column. This is going to be called Micazon Products. And then we'll call it As Company. I'll call it As Products, I guess. And let's just call this Micazon. And then this one is going to say Fudge Mart As Products. I don't even need an alias here. Right, because as long as they're column compatible, it should work. And then in the union all, I need to have, let's say, combined. Right. 
There we go. That looks better. So Micazon has 53 products. Fudge Mart has 53 products. Uh, the combined number of products across both is 40. So there are 13 products in Micazon, which are not in Fudge Mart. And there are 13 products in Fudge Mart, which are not in Micazon. It would be interesting to know what those products are, right? So the way we have to do that is we have to use a different set operator. Uh, we have to use the accept set operator because we, what we want to do is say, hey, let's list all these Micazon products except for these ones that are Fudge Mart products. And then that should give us what we want. Let's save this nice query here. And let's try and write that now. So we can say select Let's do Fudge Mart first. Okay, so these products here are found in Fudge Mart, but not found uh, in Micazon. All right. Let's do the other one. Let's do Micazon products, except those that are Fudge Mart products. Okay. So these products are found in Micazon, but not found in Fudge Mart. So let's build a combined table of both of these products, right? So I can take these and if I union them, right? So there's, just to show you, there's 13 here. Oh, there's 12 here, right? There's 12 here. And then there's 13 there. So if I union them, there should be 25 products. Well, that didn't work because the way that the operators behave, right, is it, it does this and then it accepts it with that and then it unions it with this, and then it accepts it with that. I want the accepts to happen before the union, so I have to treat these queries as if they were tables. So I have to do this. I have to say select star from this. And this will be as Mike not fudge and then we're going to union that with select star from this as fudge not mike and then that should give us the results that we want and we do get the results we want, as you'll see. There's 25, there's 25 products now. There's 13 from one and 12 from the other. Now you might be saying, well, it would be nice to know which where they came from, right? The volleyball, is that a Fudge Mart product or is that a Micazon product? So again, we need to um, produce our own column to do that. So rather than select star, we're gonna say, um, we're going to say this one here, these are Micazon. And that's going to be uh, as source. And then we're also going to include the product name. And then down here, we're going to say Fudge Mart is the source. And then we're going to include product name. And then that should give us what we want. These are Micazon products. And then these are the Fudge Mart products. 
Cool. So that sort of solves the problem of which products are particular to one company or the other, but then how do I build a combined list uh, of both of these products? All right, let's talk pivot and unpivot. So before we get into pivot and unpivot, let's talk about what we saw in the previous demo, which are table valued expressions. Table valued expression basically is a uh, any SQL or any expression, if you will, that produces a table. Okay. Now it's not a database table like you know create table. It's the output in tabular format that we're really looking at here. So an example of where you can get a table valued expression from is the from clause, from the output of a, of a full blown select statement, and also from name queries uh, using the with clause. And we will use the name queries and the with clause um, in the examples that we will do next with pivot, because the, the way pivot works is it requires a table valued expression. And rather than nesting our queries together, like we saw in the previous example, this doesn't seem to be as easy to understand as using um, named queries and with. So let's talk pivot. Pivot transforms rows into columns. The source is any table valued expression and it requires the columns that you want to pivot values, uh, the column you want to pivot on the values you want to pivot on, and the column that you want to perform some kind of aggregate operation. That is, you want to sum some values up, count values, get an average, get a min, get a max. So here's an example for you. I have this table, and one column in the table is called column, and the other value, uh, the other column is called value. Okay, and this I just did this to make it easy for you to sort of understand. But this could be called, you know, x and y. It doesn't really matter. And then the pivot operation that you apply needs an aggregate, so it will sum the value here. It will sum these values up, and then we'll do that over this column. And then you include the specific values that you would like to sum over, and these values become column names. So I'm saying for, for every A, please sum the values, A, A, A. For every B, sum the values, B, B. So if I sum the Bs, I get 10. If I sum the As, I get 1, 3, 6. Sum the As, I get 6. Sum the Bs, I get 10. So that's basically how Pivot works. It's easy to understand Pivot. It's hard to build a um, Pivot query because there's some setup that you got to do, and you have to guarantee that the setup is the way you want. It does not do any kind of group by or anything like that for you. It is only going to pivot the values you have. So you'll notice that I have two Bs that are both value 5. It can collapse those into a single column B with 10. But if there were any entity integrity here, like another column that had IDs in it, it would not do that. So again, there's some setup that we need to do to make sure that the pivot sort of kicks off the way we want it to. So basically here is the pivot process. We're gonna write our query to gather the source that we want to pivot. So we're gonna write a query that says, this is the stuff I wanna pivot. Then you name that query with width. And you do this because it becomes a lot easier to write the pivot that way, because now you can treat the query that you just wrote as a, as a table. Then we write the query using pivot. Um, based on the name query. So again, the syntax would look something like this. Um, with your named query as whatever, and that's going to be the source of your data, you will now do a select from that name query and then pivot it. And then you specify your aggregate, your column, and then the values from the column that you want to project to their own columns. Right. So whatever you put in this list here are going to end up being the new columns that you pivot on. All right, demo time. Let's try some pivots. And uh, we're going to go use the payroll database and do this. And we're going to create some really cool reports 
that show um, total payroll by department and year, and then we'll do another one with um, hours worked uh, each month in a year. Okay, and uh, that will give you a great example of how to use Pivot. Okay, we're back and you can see I've done some setup for you. And in here I have the payroll database and I've written this query here. And this query will show you individual rows of employees and their paychecks. So there's quite a few rows in here. There's 7,465 rows in this data set. And what I've done and taken a lot of care to do is only include the columns that I need uh, that are necessary to doing the pivot. So I have the employees department, which I want to appear in the rows, the years, which I, I want to pivot in the columns, and then the values that I want to sum up, which are the gross pay. So to give you a quick uh, straw man's example here, it says hardware 2018, hardware 2018, hardware 2018. These are all different people or different pay periods in the year 2018 for someone in the hardware department. And because this table does not have entity integrity, I will be able to use the pivot to collapse these values here um, with an aggregate operator like sum. If I included the employee's ID or the uh, paycheck ID, uh, it would not do what I want. And I will show you that um, after I get it to work. So once I get it to work, I will go back to this query and add in the paycheck ID like this and, and demonstrate that by doing so, I cannot, um, because each of these rows now has um, entity integrity in it, I cannot um, build the pivot the way I want. So again, I will show you that in a second, but let's actually make the pivot work. So this is step one. Step one is to source the data you want to pivot. Step two is to name it. So with, and I just call this um, pivot source. You know why? Because uh, it's a little early and I don't really, I'm horrible at naming things anyway. So there, I just named this query as pivot source. And now I'm going to use that uh, this this query in a pivot. So I'm going to say select. And to start, I always just do select star um, from pivot source. And then you say pivot. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to sum the paycheck You know, you might be wondering, well, what columns are we talking about when I say select star, right? So maybe I'll back up a bit. And if I just run this, you'll see that um, I don't have anything because I got to run the width with it, right? Um, those are my column names. So I'm going to sum paycheck gross pay. And I'm going to uh, sum that for year. In, and then I specify which years I would like to report on. So let's say we want to report on 2018 and 2019. We'll add more years later. And let's give that a whirl. Now it doesn't like 2018 because you can't really name a column a number. So I'm going to call it um, year 2018. And this one's going to be year 2019. Okay, and then now it has problems because I didn't alias. You always have to alias the pivot. So I'm just going to call it as pivot table. It's usually what I do. Oh, um, let's just, maybe that was a problem to begin with. Okay, it does not like uh, 2018 because it's a number. So let's see if we can fix that. Let's take this uh, left, right? And let's, um, I wonder, cause I gotta make a column, like let's just call it um, Y 2018 and Y 2019. And then let's put a Y in front of this like this. A little, little things that 
just sort of make you go, hmm. All right, so if I run this now, the years have a Y in front of them, maybe. Okay, it's kind of ugly, but it'll work for the for the example. And now I should be able to run this, and now I get, okay, so for year 2018, this is the sum of payroll for clothing, this is the sum of payroll for department, sum of payroll for customer service. Okay, and then this is for year 2019. Now I can add any column names I want, like I can add uh, year 2020, year 2021, year 2022, and it will generate all of them. It's just these don't have any value, so they're null. Okay, so year 2021, year 2022, those values end up being null because there's nothing in there that matches that. I wonder if I could do 2018 this way. I bet you I just figured it out. If I delimit the column like this, I bet you that works. See, if you think on things long enough, the answer will reveal itself. These brackets force the database management system to treat it um, as a um, column and not as a value. There we go. Okay, so now I get what I want. So um, by writing the pivot this way, it's going to work again, um, you know, as, as payroll continues through 2020 and into 2021 and into 2022, the same report will continue to work. So in that regard, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So let's talk about um, what happens when I add in the payroll ID. When I add in the payroll ID, now when I run this select, uh, yeah, it's paycheck ID, paycheck ID. When I add in the paycheck ID, I now have this unique value for each row. And when I run the entire query, uh, now you'll see it's a hell of a lot more granular because this paycheck ID is included. And now I'm getting one row per paycheck, which kind of defeats the purpose of the pivot because now these are all 2018. And if I go down, eventually I will find some 2019 stuff in here. There we go, 2019's in there. But that is not what I wanted. So you might say, well, oh, I can solve this problem real easy. If I just go to this select and not include paycheck ID, right? I just include employee department here. And then in addition to employee department, um, I want to include the years. So I want to include 2018. I also want to see the column 2019. I want to see the column... Now yeah, let's say 2020. It's good enough. You say, "Heh, solve the problem, right?" Well, um, you still have repetition because the source had um, that repetition in there. Okay, the source has 4,765 rows, so the pivot is going to be pivoting on the 4,765 rows again. But because that ID is in there, it, it cannot collapse those rows down. Okay, remember, it is not performing an aggregate operation. It's, it's really just, it, it is performing an aggregate operation, but it's performing it over the entire row, not just what you specify in the select here. So you have to make sure that whatever you're, you're specifying as a pivot source uh, will be able to aggregate correctly it will be able to um, aggregate the data correctly. And the means to do that is to make sure that there are, are duplicates um, in here. That is that it, it is not uh, going to have some value that is going to throw off um, the, the grouping. Okay, let's do another example from scratch. Let me take this one and save it. Let's do another example from scratch. This time we want to um, take each employee and we'll take a month from 2019 and show you how many hours they worked each month, okay? So let's, first of all, get the data. So I might say select star from employees, all right? That gives me the employees. 
and I guess I can get a little specific here. Let's do, um, let's get the um, employee ID, and then let's do employee first name plus a space plus the employee last name as employee name, and then let's join that to paychecks on employee ID and paycheck employee ID. All right. And then next to this, I need to put the hours worked. So All right. And just to show you that it's really what I want, let's uh, order by employee ID. And so there's all my paychecks, you know, through the years. Now I only wanted this for 2019. So where um, left paycheck pay period ID, all right, where cast that pay period ID as varchar, give me four of them, that's gonna be 2019, okay? Now just to prove that that's really 2019, I probably wanna add that Okay, those are really 2019s in there. See that, 2019, all of them. Now I wanna pull out the middle part here, this year, this um, right here, like this month part. Right? So there's a couple ways I can, I can attack this. First, um, I, I need, you know, there's different functions that you can use to process strings here in, in SQL, and they're gonna vary based on your DBMS. But one thing I could try to do is is get the, you know, take out the middle two, right? Because it's always the same a date, if you will. You know, let me just kind of put this aside here for a minute. A, a date, if you will. Is always the same length. It's always eight, right? So if I, I, like I can use, I think there's a, is there a, um, I think there's a, a, something I can use here. I think it's substring, substring. Oh, it, re it replaced what I had there. Substring that, and let's start at position four and grab two. Is that what I want? Okay, that got me 90. So I want to start at position five and grab two. Okay, that's 03. All right, so I, I could use this instead of using left all the time to get what I want. All right, so now that I know how to do it, let me, let me do it. So let's do this. Let's say um, cast that as varcar. And then what I want to do is I want to take sub string that five two as month. And let's see what we get here. Okay, so that's me getting paid in January. That's me getting paid in February, March. Okay, now I have the data that I want to pivot. So I want to show these in the row, this in the column, so January, February, March, April, May, and then a, a sum of the total hours of worked each um, month. Now, it doesn't really make a lot of sense um, for the salaried employees because they work the same. So I'm going to actually filter this on hourly while I'm at it and um, paycheck payroll type. It doesn't make sense to show the salaried folks because their their pay their hours don't change. See now the hours change a lot with these 
um, hourly employees. Okay, so I've set up the data. That's really step one of the pivot. So with, you know, pivot source as, I can call it whatever I want. Like I said, I'm just an old man who's tired, even though I just got up. And now I want to just give it a name and I got, I'm going to name it pivot source. And let's write our pivot now. So select star from pivot source pivot and now we are going to sum the paycheck total hours worked for month in and now I got to list all the months 01 02 I wish there was an easier way to do this there isn't there isn't that does there is but it involves some serious programming you're better off doing it this way. I need to put these brackets so that it doesn't assume they're numbers. Let me break this up a bit. For month in that and then let's end it with a parenthesis there. And then now I need to alias this as pivot table. Usually what I do. Okay. And I cannot have an order by. This is a great it's a great thing to discuss. I'm glad I included this in here and left it there. I didn't do it on purpose, but um, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. You cannot take a, a table valued expression and, and sort it ever. Okay, so I need to remove uh, this. And now I can run it, and there we go. So this is uh, a list of every employee. And in that employee, there is how many hours they worked each month um, as, as a total. So this um, some of these are nulls because uh, Rusty Cars just got hired. And, you know, that's why. And so Cook My Food, you know, didn't start working until the fifth month. And Aurora Borealis didn't start working until the twelfth month. So it's just kind of, you know, it's really kind of neat that it, it actually shows that and depicts that uh, in, in the pivot. Pivot says, you can see, it's a very useful way to, to take your data that maybe spans several rows and is really sort of hard to digest uh, and um, present it in a more um, easy to digest format. Now, normally I would be taking this data and dumping it into Excel. I would be taking maybe this data and I, I dump it into Excel, do my own pivot table. But you got to remember that if you're building some kind of application, this might be a very useful way. This might be a very useful way to view that information. And then maybe these are clickable. Like if you say, hmm, boy, Dandelions worked a lot. And you can click on that 119 and you can see his individual paychecks or something like that doing what's called a drill down. So um, that's basically how Pivot works. And that gives you an idea of how it could be used. All right, let's unwrap things with unpivot. So un unpivot transforms columns into rows. The source is any table valued expression. Again, it could be a table. It could be the result of a query, as long as it hasn't been used in an order by. Um, the, ta the value and column are names for the values and columns respectively. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but what happens is when you unpivot, you have um, this arbitrary value in this arbitrary column that come from the set of columns that you're trying to collapse. Remember, this transforms a series of columns into rows. And the columns um, in your list must be of the same physical data type. So here's a good example. In this example, A and B are the columns in my column list. So what this is going to project to is a value right, which is just an arbitrary 
column name for these things, 3, 6, 10, and 2. And then another column name, which I chose to call column, which will project to A, A, B, B. So A, 3, A, 6, B, 2, B, 10. You don't have to call them value and column. You can call them cheese and crackers if you want. You call them whatever you want. So because I unpivot value, the values go here, but I can unpivot you know, cheese and it would say cheese and there would be values. And then what comes after four are the, are the actual columns that get unpivoted. And I, I chose to call that column here and I have A, A, B, B. So you see uh, A3, A6, B2, B10. So you might be wondering, you know, why would you use something like this? Um, I will give you a great demonstration of that. Sometimes you are faced with a situation where the data that you have been given is not queryable in its format. And so you need to transform it, taking things in columns and putting them into rows so that it's easier to um, find the information you need. Okay, so let's, without further ado, let's do yet another example. We've all seen it. We've all used it. It's those online forms that you fill out that ask you for things like your name and your email and your phone number. And then usually when you get the phone number, it's got like, what's your home phone? What's your work phone? What's your cell phone? You know, do you have some kind of other phone? You know, I don't know. And the issue with this is that we usually do not separate the data collection process. You know, it's very convenient to just enter your home phone, your cell phone, your work phone from the way that we choose to store it. That is, we store the data the same way it's collected. And what ends up happening is we get a table like this. And a table like this, you might say, hey, that's no problem, right? But where it becomes a challenge is uh, when you need to find a specific phone number. Because number one, you have to know contextually, is it a home phone number? Is it a work phone number? Is it a mobile phone number, right? And um, this ends up being a, a little bit of contention. Also, the other problem is if you just wanted to find, for example, phone numbers that are in a certain area code, um, you can't do that easily or conveniently, if at all. So let's suppose I'm tasked with finding all the phone numbers in the three uh, in the 415 area code. So I might say um, from contacts, right? You know, where, now which phone number is it? Where home phone uh, is like 415. Okay, that gets me, that gets me one of them, but it doesn't get me all of them. So you might say, all right, well, or, you know, mobile phone, like 415. You can already see that this is gonna get annoying rather quickly. And it's also not very helpful because, yeah, okay, the mobile phone's 415, the home phone's 415, but now Sherry Wine's home phone shows up and that's 315. <laughs> this data is unqueryable. Uh, as it exists. So it was great to collect the data this way. I'm sure the form that was made um, is extremely productive because it's not um, overly complicated for the end user to enter the data, but this is certainly not the way we want to store the data. And by the way, this is a great example of the difference between the internal model and the external model. We want our internal models to store data in a way that is easy for us to query and report on and use. And we want it to be dry, right? Dry, we do not want to repeat ourselves. Don't repeat, don't, don't repeat yourself. Dry. And you can see we're repeating ourselves here. We have home phone, mobile phone, work phone, other phone, right? They're all phone numbers. One person, Caesar Salad, has many phone numbers. In this case, two. The other person, Sherry Wine, has three phone numbers. And so there's got to be a better way. Remember, at the intersection of row and column, there should be one atomic piece of data. Really, at the intersection of, of, of contact and phone number, I have three phone numbers. So... I, what I should have done is used another table. Uh, you know, sometimes we can it, we can improve our design. 
Other times, we cannot improve our design because we are not in control of the schema we are given. And therefore, rather than wrestle with the schema, we need to figure out a way that we can work with it make, it, make it do our bidding for us. And this is a great example of where you might want to employ on pivot. So let's give it a whirl with unpivot. Let me take this and I'll just copy this in here, save it for later, as I like to do with my code. And let's go back here and, and we'll do one on pivot. Now you can unpivot the same way you pivot by, by setting things up. But basically what I want to unpivot is this. I want to unpivot exactly this data. So I don't need to put a with statement on this. So I'm just going to say unpivot. Now the way unpivot works, remember, is you have a um, value first. Then you have um, four column in, and then these columns here are the actual columns in the context table that you want to unpivot. So in here, I'm going to say home phone, mobile phone, work phone, other phone. Because that's what I want to unpivot. The value, what what is in these phone number columns? There's a phone number in here. So I'm going to call this a phone number. The column is the values of these. What is that? This is going to be phone type, right? Home phone, mobile phone, work phone, other phone, phone type, right? And then I have to alias this uh, as unpivot table and boom there you have it so what it what it what it has done is it has gone through this source I guess what I probably should do is put them side by side for you and every time there is a value Caesar salad home phone it writes them out to the query output. These are nulls for mobile phone and work phone, so those are not included. So for Caesar sale, I just have two phones, home phone, other phone, other phone, home phone. Sherry Wine has three phones. So home phone, mobile phone, and work phone. So that's unpivoting. Now here's the big advantage of doing an unpivot. Now, let's think back to my original query that I wanted to write. That query is now easy. So let's use with, with unpivot with new context as this. Now I can say select from new contacts where phone number like 415. Now it's queryable. There's the phone numbers that are only 415. There's the phone numbers that are 415 and only. 415. Maybe I just want to get the home phone numbers or the work phone numbers, right? I could do that. I could say, I guess I'll save this one because that's what we wanted to do originally. Okay. And before I go nuts here, let's talk about making this into a view. So this is a great candidate for a view because it takes data that we have in a table that we normally cannot control because we didn't write the application that made this table uh, or maybe we don't have permissions to modify this table or maybe we're just not ready to modify the table at this point 
And we have now transformed that table into something that's usable. And we want to be able to do this whenever we want to query it. So this is a great um, opportunity to use a view. What a view would do, create view v new contacts. Let's not call it new contacts. Let's call it v contacts as. And we can just do this select as part of the view. There. And then I want to do an up and a down. So drop view if exists v context. Go. Let's see if this works. Okay, now if I go over here to the demo database and I go to views, I see that there's now a logical view v contacts. I can now use that as a table if I want. Save this stuff. And I can go over here and say select star from v contacts. And uh, I can now say um, where phone type is in home phone, mobile phone, just to get the phone numbers that are home phones or mobile phones. <clears throat> Check that out, huh? That's pretty pretty sweet and easy to do. Right, and I can also uh, try to get all the phone numbers that end in a nine. You know where phone number like percent nine. There's the phone numbers that end in a nine. Can very convenient. So that's again a nice thing about views. Now to show you that this really does exactly what you think it's doing. I guess let me save this code here. If I go back to the table, and let's have some fun here. Um, let's change, well, let's pick on Caesar salad. Let's update contacts. So Caesar salad goes back to the form online on the, you know, on the website or on the, you know, in the intranet or whatever it is. And he updates his contact information. He updates contacts. He sets his uh, mobile phone to, uh, let's say he sets it to 316-555-3305. And he um, sets the work phone to be 415-555-5567. And then he sets the other phone to null, meaning he clears it out. This is this should be right, right away uh, it, a reason why we're doing something wrong because someone shouldn't have to clear out a phone number, right? Um, but that's neither here nor there. We'll deal with that later on in the course. And then the contact is one. So this will update. Oop, um, I got to put a where in there, don't I? Where contact ID is one. So that updates that row. Now it's different. Mobile phone, work phone. Now I write a query. Where phone number like 316, right? And lo and behold, remember a view is just a layer on top of the underlying table, so it works. I don't have to do anything to the view. It passes through running this query. And then after it runs this query, it applies this where clause to it. And then I get the results. So that's a huge advantage of views is, you know, you change the data in the underlying table. You don't have to do anything to the views that are ready to rock and roll.
All right, let's finish up with temporal tables. So temporal tables allow us to keep a history of all the inserts, updates, and deletes that are done to the table. Um, th these can be used so that you can see what the data looked like at any point in time or to allow us to see how the changes reflect uh, in the data over time. This is part of the ANSI SQL 2011 standard. Not every DBMS implements temporal tables, uh, but most of the big ones do, like the ones from Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft. Uh, temporal tables are very useful for tracking changes to the data, performing an analysis um, over time of the data, finding errors and outliers, and also auditing, like who changed what. So this is uh, where they commonly get used. So the structure of a temporal table is it has a current table plus a history table. We only really see the current table and all the inserts, updates, and deletes go into the current table. And then the system manages the history table for us by taking any obsolete versions, like after you update data, what happens to the old data? When you delete data, what happens to the old data? It goes into a history table. And in that history table, it keeps track of a time period of when that data was relevant. So you have to think a little differently when you're using a temporal table um, if you want to understand what the change is being made. Now, normally you could just do inserts, updates, and deletes and look at the current table and not even care about the, the history table, but you might want to understand what you see in that history table. So when you insert into a um, temporal table, it just adds to the current table. When you update, the old row goes into the history table and the new row the changes that you made go into the current table. Likewise, when you delete, right, the old row goes into the history table and the um, current row gets deleted. Now, when you force a delete, right, the end period time is set to when it was deleted, right? So that way, when you're looking at the history table, you, you know at this point in time, it's gone, right? And in an update scenario, same thing. At the point that it was updated and changed, it now puts that row in the history table and then sets that end period time to be when it was updated. So that way you know at what point in time the data looked like. Now, when you go to query a history table or when you go to query a temporal table, you never really talk directly to the history table. So this is basically the boilerplate to making, a te making any table into a temporal table. You need to specify two columns, and you can call them whatever you want. I usually call them valid from and valid to, and these are called your period columns. And what makes them a period column is you set a period for system time in the range of valid from, valid to. Now, you don't want to be entering data into these two columns. You want the system to do it. So you have to do two things. One is you have to say this column here is generated as the row start, valid from, and this column that I called valid two is generated as the row end. And then if you already have data in the table and you're adding the temporal table, you need to set defaults so that <clears throat> when there's null, it will put in a value for, for these because there always needs to be a value in the from and the to fields. And if you already had data in the table, it won't at the time that you alter it. So these are the defaults I add. This first default says, the start, the row start, if it's missing, should be a second before the current date and time. That's what this says. So you don't have a row start in there. Add one that's a second before right now. Okay. The row end is the very last date that a database knows about, which is the year 9999, 1231, you know, a, a, a fraction of a second before midnight. Okay. We'll all be long gone by the time this date hits. So that's what you need to add to the table for prerequisites. Then after you add these prerequisites, you can turn um, temporal tables on by saying system versioning on, and then set the history table uh, to the table name. And I usually like to label my history table, table name underscore history. You can leave out the history table, but then the system will generate the, the history table for you. And uh, you, you really don't want to be in that business of doing that. You want to actually control your, your, um, the names of your history tables. <clears throat> okay, let's do a quick demo where we make 
a temporal table out of an existing table using our, our boilerplate and then we'll show you what is going on with the temporal with the uh, current table which looks like a normal table and then of course the history table as well all right i'm out here in azure data studio again and i am now looking at the books table over here and we are also looking at the output of the books table down here and you can see that it just has some regular columns in it and what we're going to do is we are going to add the columns required to make this a temporal table I'm going to add the valid from and the valid to with the defaults. And I need to add the defaults here because there's already data in the table. And then I'm going to set the system time period to the from and to dates. And this again is what's going to, is going to um, set the temporal nature of the table. So I'll run this first. And I have a, an error here somewhere. All right, I got it to run. It seemed to not like the fact that I didn't name the constraints. So what I did was that rather than just leaving default here, uh, I went ahead and named the constraints. It's probably always a good idea to do that anyway. So it's DF books, valid from, valid to. So when I do that and I rerun books, well, first of all, let me go over here and refresh this. So now I have valid from, valid to as columns in this table. And if I run the query on the books table I can see that there are values for valid from and valid to and I didn't enter those values the system entered those values okay that's first things first that gives us the columns necessary to make a temporal table and then I can run this query here Uh, to make the I got to call it books, right? Books. Screwed that up. Books. And now I have made the temporal table. So now that I refresh demo, I see books, and it says a system version, and there's a little clock on there because this shows you that it's a temporal table and under here there's the history table so now that I have that that history table in there I can do a select from books this is what the table looks like right now and this is what the table looks like historically which is going to be empty because there's nothing that I've changed in this data that would force anything to show up in the history table. So let's quickly make a change here. Let's um, change the price of the first book to 9.95. So update books set book retail price to $9.95 where book ID is equal to one. Just to show you like that's right now it's 4.95 for the book. Now ah, let's make it 1995. Let's jack it up. One row affected. Uh, now it's 1995 for the book. And in the history table, we should see 495 for the book. And the dates, you know, valid from when it was first added, valid to the date that the update ran. So if I roll back time, I will be able to see what this book looks like before I change the price. That's basically the idea behind a temporal table. Now, when you use temporal tables, you're, you don't get in the habit of querying the history table at all. And as a matter of fact, I cannot directly edit the rows uh, in the history table. I cannot insert into the history table. I cannot update the history table. I can't say update book books history. Actually, that's bad form. Let me do this. Let's try to delete delete from books history let's just delete everything out of there 
Can I delete rows from a temporal history table? Okay. When you establish a system version temporal table, <clears throat> you cannot manipulate the history table. It is, it, is, it is managed by the system. It is managed by the system. You actually have to turn off system versioning in order to manage the table, which we will look at a little later on. All right, when you're in the habit, uh, when you're actually doing the querying of temporal tables, you need to be in the habit of putting in a clause on the after the table, that's a temporal table, you need to put in a, a clause here called for system time. So, you know, you say select star from a bunch of tables and then join or whatever, and then eventually when you hit a temporal table, if you want the current table, you do nothing. If you want data from the history table, you need to include for system time and then a clause. And then the clause is one of these five clauses. And basically, these clauses um, determine what data you will see. So if you want data in a point in time, you use as of. If you want data um, that falls within a range, anywhere within the range, then you use either from or between. From does not include the lower bound, between does. If you're looking for a, hist a piece of history that is contained within a range fully, then you use contained in. So from allows you to like say, like if I said it's between um, January and April, and it goes from January to June, that would be included in from, but that would not be included in contained in because it has to be completely bounded by, by start and end. That's fundamentally the difference. And then, of course, there's the throw your hands up and ask for everything, which is um, for system time all, which uh, will give you uh, the current data and the history data. And this is useful for building a, a time series. Alrighty, so let's uh, explore this with a, another demo. And in this demo, what we will do is we will look at a stocks table that is in your database that is already set as a temporal uh, table. And we'll just kind of practice some temporal queries. Okay, let's have at it. All right, here we are out in Azure Data Studio and I am looking at the stocks table and you can see that I have a ticker and a price and my valid from and to, these are part of my valid um, time period for the history table, uh, for the temporal table, I should say. Now, normally you would not show these, but uh, for the sake of demonstration purposes, I wanna show them to you so you get a better grasp of it. But normally we would be looking at our data like this, you know, cause it's current data. Hey, there's the data. So you might wanna see what this data looked like on a specific time. And we can do that using a temporal query. We could say select from stocks for system time as of. And let's see what the, the stocks look like on 2020, um, 04, 05. Okay, so here is the stock price currently. And here's the stock price uh, two days ago. So four, seven, four, five. And you can see they are different. This information is retrieved from the history table for us because it's we don't want to be in the practice of querying the history table. We want to just ask the table for a particular time period or a range of time periods. So let's try a, another example. Maybe you want to see all of the different changes in one stock, right? So you could do select everything from stocks for system time all. And that's going to show you all the stocks and all the changes that have been made over time to the stocks. And now you might just want to pick one of these stocks like 
where ticker is Apple, and then order by valid from. And then this will give you a time series of the Apple stock. So, you know, on 4.1, that was a price. On 4.2, that was a price. 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. So I have a history of all the different prices. And I know which one is current because the current one um, has a valid two date that still works with today's date, which is sometime in September. So this is still the current the current. Uh, Apple stock. Also, if I just query the stocks table, I would get the current Apple price, which is 125. Again, I'll go back and look at this one. And the current price is 125. Okay. So let's continue on with another type of temporal query. You may want to might want to find the um, particulars of a a specific change. So you might want to know all the stocks that were affected over um, a certain time period, for example. So let me demonstrate that. I might say select um, all from stocks where um, for system time between, and let's do something like noon noon on the second so 2020 04 02 at noon uh, and 2020 0403 at noon see all these stock prices were updated uh, at midnight but we're gonna check a range, um, a 24 hour range um, uh, at noon, just to show you what this will yield. And just to make things simple, I'm just going to put a where clause in here where um, ticker is Apple. That way we don't see a whole bunch of stuff, we just see the Apple stuff. Okay, so I see two stocks because this first stock. Um, it's valid from and to falls within this range. A piece of it falls within the range, so it shows up. And I see this next stock down here, this next version of Apple, because uh, this one, again, a slice of this valid from and to falls within this range. So when you use between or when, when you use from, all you need is a piece of the valid from and to to land within this range. And the difference between from and between is that between includes is inclusive with this bottom range. So it can it can hit that bottom range exactly and it would be included, whereas from does not. Okay. So that's very handy when you're just trying to find any one of the stocks that, that falls within that range. Um, and it doesn't have to be completely bounded by the range. So let's do an example of ones that need to be bounded by the range. So if I do this, take the same um, query, and now I say for system time contained in, and the syntax of this is a little weird. You know, it's an interval like that. I should get nothing here because none of these stocks fall within this range. And I don't. I, I get nothing because, again, these stocks change over. Their prices changed over at midnight. And I'm asking for stocks contained within a, a range that goes from noon to noon. But if I if I were to stretch this out to two days, like if I go out to 4.4, four, then I should get all the stocks on 4.3 because they fall within this range. Let's see. Yes. So the stock that changed from midnight on 4.3 to midnight 4.4, that from and to falls within the range of noon on 4.2, which is over here, and 4.4 uh, four noon, which is on the outside. So this valid from val2 falls within that. So that's the difference between contained in and between. Between, all it's got to do is hit the range. Um, 
contained and it has to be fully encompassed within the range. That's basically how temporal queries work. It's part of the from clause. So technically this is part of the from clause. And I might take that and join that to some other table on whatever. And, and remember that this is treated as the whole table, right? Because you're asking that temporal table to report rows within a certain range. And if I can join it to another table and that table might be a temporal table. So I might have a four in there, right? And then in that case, I would have the four and then on and then A equals B. So that's basically how you join tables together that are also temporal tables. All right, let's conclude with a little talk about temporal table maintenance. As you can imagine, these tables get big. Okay, so there are times where you need to perform some degree of maintenance on the temporal table, like you might want to remove some rows from it. You actually might want to archive the temporal table and then start another one, for example. So how do you do that? Basically, the alter table com uh, uh, command, system versioning, set it to off. That disables the temporal table. That keeps the history table around so that you can then do whatever you need to do to the history table. You can now treat the history table like a normal table and do inserts, updates, and deletes. Um, then you can re-enable uh, the temporal table and, and choose a different history table or the same one. It doesn't matter. And this gives us a lot of different options as to how we want to um, keep the history table under wraps and also um, sort of maintain our, our temporal table. In, in my use of temporal tables, what I have done is there's usually some kind of archival period based on um, when the history data is no longer needed in the production uh, environment, in the original environment that it was in. For example, once that data gets lo maybe loaded into a data warehouse, I, I no longer need to retain the values that were th since loaded into that data warehouse. Um, also, um, it can be also at a, an accounting period, like a quarterly or at the end of a fiscal year that you decide um, to roll over or truncate your temporal tables. So let's do a very quick example of that now. All right, I'm out in Azure Data Studio here and I have, um, I have this books table and the books history table and see there's my books table and then there's my one row of history. Let's turn off the temporal table. So I can alter the table, books, and set system versioning to off. That will turn off the temporal table. And if I then refresh demo over here, now I just have a table called books and another table called books history. See that? And I can do this. And I can actually insert a row into books history. I can actually edit books history if I want. Check this out. I can do update. I don't know why you do this, but I can update books history. And I can set set the book author first name to Sonny, uh, where book ID is a one. And I could do that. It's got no problem now. It's just a regular table. Now it's Sonny Sue Art of War, right? It's just a regular old table. So I can turn this back on with another alter table, right? So if I want to turn the history table back on or uh, turn the temporal table back on, but I should specify my history table as right. And now it's back on again and I'll show you that over here. back on 
And unfortunately now I, I messed around with that history table. Um, and now it's Sunny Sue. And if I were to go back and look at what system time as of, it would say Sunny Sue. Right? Not ideal. But here's um, a common use case of doing this is you can switch out your history table. When your history table, uh, it's time to archive it, you can, you can switch it out. So um, I could do this. I can turn off. system versioning and then I can turn on system versioning and pick a new history table so I'm gonna call this history table you know let's call this one history 2020 and let's suppose I change them around every year you're never gonna touch the history table directly so the name of the history table is irrelevant so if I look here at books and refresh, uh, and then refresh, I can see that I have a books history table, which is a completely different table. And then in books, I have the books history 2020 table. And this is no longer the actual history table for the um, temporal table. It's now this one. And so this gives me a chance to, and you can see there's no history in this table. This gives me a chance to maybe roll over my history, um, archive it, whatever. Um, generally, I, I do not take this approach. I will turn off the history table. I will remove old rows from the history table and put them somewhere else so that I have them and then re-enable the history table. And that's how I keep the length of my history table under wraps. Generally, what can happen and what will happen is every time a row gets changed in your database, the um, that change adds a row to the history table. And because of that, they can get rather large. And so it's, it's imperative that you perform some kind of maintenance on, on that history table to just kind of keep it under wraps. All right, that was a long one, but this concludes our unit on advanced database concepts. We talked about the set operators, union, union all, accept and intersect. These allow us to write very complicated queries by combining the outputs of multiple select statements together. Extremely useful. And sometimes the only way that you can query data the way you want. Uh, we saw the pivot operator lets us transform rows into columns based on um, aggregate, some kind of aggregate operator that we choose. And this is very useful for sort of presenting a lot of data in a very uh, small area of real estate. And then there's the unpivot clause, which uh, allows us to trans transform our data from columns into rows. And this is very useful for making the data easier to query. And then, of course, we saw temporal tables, which allow us to keep history of the changes made in a table and inspect the data over time or at a point in time. Thanks. We'll see you later.